the Croatian continuous delivery pipelines and for that you probably want to use Kubernetes or, or something else as the orchestration on pushing your software in the pro towards production. So it gives you kind of nice idea on the things you should be looking at when going more and more into this cloud native thinking and, and cloud native ways of working and, and those technologies involved in the in the landscape. Um, CNCF also provides uh, training for for these uh, cloud native technologies and of course Kubernetes being one of the, the main ones here. Uh, the Kubernetes Fundamentals course is actually pretty okay online course. I, 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 I did it myself like I think a couple of years ago already. It, at least back then it was pretty good so I, I don't think it's gotten any worse at least. <laughs> I, I, I hope, at least I hope that, that yeah. it, it hasn't gotten any worse. Uh, and then once, once you build confidence and, and really use Kubernetes for a bit, uh, you can also apply the certification tests for, for that. Uh, so there's two different versions, one for the administration of the clusters and one for the application development part, focusing on a bit different aspects on, on the system. Don't, 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't scare me with technology today anymore. Uh, yeah, so at least on my experience, these certification tests are actually super nice. I mean, they are hard, which actually makes them like really mean something. It's not just a rubber stamp on some paper. So you really have to understand what you're doing when doing those certification tests. So people seem to value those quite a lot around the world. So might be a good thing to have on your CV for a job market, for example. Uh, for C uh, CNCF runs also a, a conformance program for Kubernetes. So whenever you see a vendor providing you a Kubernetes of some sorts. Make sure that they have an official stamp that okay, it's really certified Kubernetes. So it's actually a, a set of automated tests that really hammer your clusters and really verify that it, it is Kubernetes and it works as Kubernetes should work. So I can't really put my Mac, sell my Mac to anybody and say that that's Kubernetes for you. It probably won't won't pass the conformers test. Uh, there's a lot of different partners that provide various things on, 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 on Kubernetes. Either, uh, either products based on Kubernetes, services, consultation, training, and whatnot. You, you can of course find the, the full list on the on the CNCF websites. Sorry. <laughs> Not a good day. Yeah, but the clusters are provisioning. <laughs> Google seemed, seemed more battleproof this time. All right, but hey, <clears throat> let's dive in finally to the, to the actual topic of today. And then let's talk a bit on, on, on Kubernetes. So, <clears throat> Kubernetes is really something that, that uh, is built to kind of pilot or helmsman of the, of the ship. And if, if, if you've been looking around and, and already playing around with Kubernetes, you've probably noticed that 
most of the project projects around Kubernetes have some sort of a C-like theme, and that's the reason. And it's now super hard to, if you're uh, bootstrapping a new open source project, for example, it's a difficult thing now to figure out a good name for that. So <clears throat> essentially Kubernetes is, is, is really a, a container orchestration system. So <clears throat> originally out of folks at, at Google, but now fully sort of owned or, or steered by the, by the CNCF Foundation. Uh, and and uh, what's really good about the, the whole start of Kubernetes is that, that uh, at Google there was a lot of experience on building these sort of a orchestration systems, uh, mainly, mainly uh, on, on Borg and Omega. There's a lot of good, good papers on, on the learnings and, and how Google built Borg and Omega systems. So when you, whenever you have free time, as, as probably all we have a lot, uh, it's always a good to, to sort of take a look back and, and read how read a bit on, on the history. Also, one of the good things on, on the on the basically from day one when when uh, Joe Bira and, and and others started to work on Kubernetes was the fact that. Uh, they built everything as, as more or less loosely coupled building blocks in the system. So from day one, Kubernetes has been extensible in, uh, in many different ways, which basically means that uh, there's a lot of extension points for you and, and for the community to build on. Uh, one way to think about Kubernetes is actually sort of the Linux kernel way. So Kubernetes itself provides you the, the sort of minimum viable product in a sense. Uh, kind of provides you the kernel of, this, of, of, of a solution to run your production services on, for example. Most probably on production you need a lot of additional components running on the cluster to help you actually be successful. But Kubernetes is, is more like kind of Linux kernel in a way that it provides you the kernel of the solution. Uh, and uh, as we're talking about containers, we really, and, and Kubernetes also abstracts away the underlying infrastructure from you as a developer or as an operations guy. So meaning that when I deploy my services on Kubernetes running on DigitalOcean, well, not today, but, but maybe tomorrow it works. And, and on Amazon, for example, the Kubernetes works exactly the same way. I can just shoot my application, it pretty much works the same way. So there's a lot of abstraction built with Kubernetes and it really helps you for example, in customer cases where customers might run things on, on bare metal, on on-premise, or on clouds, or maybe doing some sort of a migrations or, or whatnot. It gives you nice, nice ways to do that also. Uh, one way I always describe Kubernetes is, is kind of like uh, these modern-ish NoSQL databases they're always eventually consistent. And that's, a, at least on my, my, my mind, it, that, that's a good way to describe Kubernetes. So it's really an engine to resolve your desired state with the actual state of the cluster. We'll talk a lot more on, on that in, in coming slides. Uh, Kubernetes-based systems are, are always, well, not always, but, but usually self-healing. So Kubernetes will always try to steer your cluster towards the desired state and to match the desired state, thus 
sort of eventually consistent. So when you say that I, you, you want to have three instances of Redis database or data store to always be running, Kubernetes basically says that, OK, I'll try to ensure you that you will always have three instances running. And then something goes sideways, which still happens in 2019 in, even in cloud environments. Uh, one of the node dies, one of the Redis instances dies for some reason. Kubernetes is going to try to do things to have you three instances of Redis running again. So either it'll retry, uh, it might try to restart the failed container on the same node. If the node has died completely, it probably spins up a new Redis on some healthy node. Or in some environment, it might actually spin up new nodes for us, depending on the environment and how we've set up the cluster. A uh, bunch of, so, bunch of uh, sort of more advanced use cases. We can auto scale the workloads. So, say you have like uh, huge traffic spikes coming into your system, Kubernetes automatically can scale up your services within the cluster. And also when Kubernetes is integrated to cloud provider infrastructures, like for Amazon, with Amazon, for example, Kubernetes can actually sort of ask more resources from Amazon. Okay, I cannot spin up new containers anymore. I'm full, give me more capacity. And after it, Kubernetes sees more capacity, it can bring up new containers to serve uh, to serve the, the traffic. We can do blue-green deployments on, on, uh, on the services running. We can do one-off jobs. We can do even cron jobs. Cron jobs is actually a super nice concept. It's basically like cron tab on your Linux, but it's distributed in a cluster. It's a super nice feature. We can manage, of course, stateless applications pretty easily. And uh, stateful to state meaning persistent data somewhere on some sort of a disk. Whether it's a physical disk or not, that's a, not a discussion. Uh, Kubernetes by itself provides native ways to do service discovery. So if you're running this sort of a microservice type of architectures, uh, it can provide those basic features on how the services can actually locate each other. And as everything in the world of Kubernetes is kind of an API driven, it's super easy to integrate anything into Kubernetes to extend the functionality, to make it work for you, automate some of your tasks and, and, and things for you easily. And yeah, as mentioned, um, as everything is uh, API driven in Kubernetes, you use the, the exact same API to control the cluster, regardless of where you run it, whether it's running on your basement in your Raspberry Pis or whether you run it on Amazon. And that's a huge benefit. Kind of a de facto standard REST API to control all your systems, more or less. Uh, <clears throat> these are actually somewhat old numbers, but, but uh, the community around Kubernetes works super fast. There's like 15,000 contributors for the Kubernetes project itself. There's like 32,000 commits in the last year or so. It's like, poof. which also means that it is a bit hard to keep up with Kubernetes. Even for me, as I'm 
daily working with Kubernetes. And in most days I have to work with Kubernetes internals even. It's, it's a, more like a full-time job to keep up with what's happening around Kubernetes. But of course it also means that it's getting more and more stable every day. More and more features, more and more extensions and whatnot. As I mentioned that Kubernetes is really extensible in many different ways. That also means that, that Kubernetes is sort of a platform for platforms. So in itself, it sort of provides the kernel of the solution. But there's many, many building blocks that you can kind of put as an add-ons on your cluster, which kind of builds more and more abstractions. Things that where you can actually run your own applications as like server, serverless applications and, and whatnot. So you can really go and build your own Heroku-like thing on Kubernetes. And I think there's, I've seen in some open source projects that do it out of box or even. There was, there was something, forgot the name already, but. So basically where you can do git push and everything works like magic. Whether that's black magic or not, that's another discussion again. Okay. So when kind of looking at high level on Kubernetes and, and, and high level for the internals of Kubernetes, uh, there's few important components and, 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 and not really important as a, as a basic user. You don't really usually at least have to understand how they work, but you should understand what's the role of those components in the, in the cluster. Uh, <clears throat> the main one being, of course, the API server that provides the REST API through which you control basically everything. Whether you want to deploy your own services on your production cluster, whether you want to control something, you do everything through the REST API. All the data is stored on etcd data store, that's like key value database with strong consistencies. So that's the single source of truth in the cluster. That has the truth that, okay, there should be always three instances of Redis running. That's stored on etcd. There's controller manager doing most of the heavy lifting, creating pods from deployments, doing various other things. Scheduler makes the, all the decisions where a pod, where a container should be running. We'll take a bit closer look on some of the components in, in coming slides. Then when we look on the node, I mean the, the worker nodes which actually run the workloads. Uh, so, so those are called the, the worker plane. So there's a distinction between the control plane and the worker plane. On the worker plane, you of course have some operating system running. Today it can be even Windows, which is fully, fully-ish supported on Kubernetes. Don't ask me anything more, I don't know anything about Windows. Usually it's, it's a Linux thing. And today we are gonna be running things on Linux clusters. Uh, there's some container runtime, could be Docker, could, could be Creo, Container D, even Rocket, maybe, maybe not anymore. On top of the container runtime, there's a sort of node agent of the cluster running on each of the nodes called Kubelet that integrates with the container runtime 
and, and creates those containers and, and whatnot on the, on the container runtime when, when needed. And then there's components to provide the networking capabilities between your workloads running in the cluster. So there's actually a few different networking components. We'll take a look on those in, in a bit more detail also. Uh, <coughs> KubeADM is a tool to sort of set up a, a kind of minimum viable cluster for you according to known best practices in the community. Lucas is one of the lead maintainers of KubeADM, among other things. <clears throat> so you basically can run KubeADM as a, as a bootstrapping tool on the node. You, you connect into the cluster. And by that, you, you create the cluster and the API providing the access controls for the, for the cluster. Then layer three is something that KubeADM won't be touching on, at least currently, and probably not in the future either. So KubeADM won't get you your Kubernetes cluster really connected into the cloud provider infrastructure. It doesn't provide you monitoring tools. It doesn't go and set up Prometheus for you out of the box. It doesn't go and set up Elk stack for your logs and, and whatnot. It provides you the kernel, again, the kernel of the solution, according to best practices. Uh, there are other tools, open source projects, to, to, to then provide these kind of added scope. COPS, for example, is one, one of the more widely used tools. We as in Container provide some tools to take kind of full, full scope of the, of, the, of the stack. There's like tens of different open source tools around to, to help you bootstrap and actually manage the, the, cl the cluster. All right, the API server. So yeah, it's a REST API. Well, REST-ish at least. Uh, <clears throat> and it provides you the, the, the kind of sort of user-facing interface to control the, the whole cluster. And it's sort of, in, in, a, in, a, in a way, it also provides you an interface towards the data store, the etcd database. You shouldn't really be trying to write directly to etcd. I'm pretty sure you will break it. At least I've broken it more than once. Uh, what's super nice in the, in the Kubernetes internal architecture is, is the fact that all the Kubernetes internal components also talk with the API server. None of the Kubernetes components actually talk to etcd data store directly. So there's only one link to etcd and it's always through the api server and as that that's the fact it also means that uh, the api server is sort of gatekeeper to the system so the api server handles all the authentication and authorization related things request validation admission control and everything Just a couple of words on etcd. We won't go too deep on that because that's that that's another yeah. four or eight <laughs> hours of workshop. Yeah, and this is these are also more for reading. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, one thing to to understand about etcd is that uh, <clears throat> uh, it's based on Raft protocols, so meaning you have to have consensus available in your system. So if you build your, your control plane to be highly available, 
let's say on three VM instances. You can lose one of the instances and the control plane will work because you have two out of three working. So we can reach consensus. But if you lose the second one and are left with one, everything is broken. Just go home and open a beer. Nothing works anymore. Because with one out of three, you cannot reach consensus anymore. I think that's the most important part to understand about etcd in the, in the context of Kubernetes. That's also what can easily break you. <laughs> well, and that, that's, that's basically sort of because it's based on Raft protocol, which is somewhat error prone to clock skews and, and whatnot, network conditions and everything around it, probably even to sunspots or something. Uh, controller manager. I usually actually describe controller manager as a package of while true loops. So in a cluster, when you create something or, or when you say to the cluster that I want to have three Redis instances running, the API server does actually nothing. It just stores the information on its CD and then says to you that, OK, we'll try to do it. Then on the controller manager, the set of while true loops basically running that, OK, while true, I have a deployment for Redis, should have three instances, has zero, I need to do something. It does something and goes back to start. So yes, controller manager is essentially a set of glorified while true loops. Uh, <clears throat> the scheduler is the, is the placement engine. It's a really rich in, in policies in a way so you can actually configure the placement of your workloads. But essentially it's, it, it, it uh, selects the best place for your workload to run at a given time. By default it, it, it does sort of a pin pack algorithm so it tries to pack your, your nodes pretty full. Uh, but of course, you can control the placement of your workloads with uh, hardware requirements, affinity rules, anti-affinity rules. Anti-affinity meaning you have a service and another service. You might say that, OK, at any given point of time, don't run these services on the same node for some reason. There might be some reasons for that. And if you're super interested how scheduling works and how difficult problem scheduling actually is, you can actually go and replace the scheduler in the system. So that's one of the uh, ex extension points. You can swap out the scheduling part. Don't try it. It's a freaking difficult problem. I, we, we, we at Condena, before Kubernetes came, became so popular, we actually did write, write our own scheduler. And it's a difficult problem. Kubelet, uh, the node agent. So that's the, the agent, sort of agent sitting on each of the nodes. Uh, responsible for managing the life cycle of the pods and containers on that host. So Kubelet doesn't care anything about the cluster as a whole. Kubelet cares on its own node and its own container runtime. It doesn't care anything else. Uh, Kubelet is, is uh, one way to think about Kubelet is al also think of it as a, as a kind of a stupid guy working in a factory. It does only the things you say it should be doing. It does nothing else. It doesn't make any decisions of its own regarding the cluster state and the cluster as a whole. So basically the API server or 
some controller these while loops say to kubelet that okay you should have this redis container running with this configuration and kubelet runs it it doesn't do anything else of course i'm simplifying things just a pin bit but but uh that's essentially how kubelet works could also think of it as a babysitter. Yeah, kind of a glorified <laughs> agent responsible of restarting everything if, if something breaks down. Sort of a glorified janitor on, on the node. Yeah. <clears throat> Kubelet itself provides some HTTP APIs also for metrics and a bunch of other things, but usually you, you shouldn't have to care about those that much. Container runtime. Uh, Docker is still the default, yes? Is it, Lucas? Uh, yes. Yes, still it is the still the default. <laughs> But more and more yeah. every day, I've been seeing people run something else as the container runtime as Docker. I think container D is one of the most used nowadays. We at Contena use basically in all of our clusters, we use Creo, but there's a bunch of other, other alternatives. The good thing is that uh, there's the standard CRI container runtime interface sort of abstracting away the container runtime details even from Kubelet. So Kubelet doesn't really understand anything about Docker. It understands how to call the CRI interface behind which, which Docker is sitting basically. And that has, uh, in, the, in the last year or so, maybe last year and a half, that has actually spun a lot of different kind of style of container runtimes to be used with Kubernetes. These sort of Docker, container, D, Creo type of things, those are the sort of typical container-based things, container runtimes. But like things like Kata containers are actually running the containers. Well, the container is actually a virtual machine. So which creates more isolation, better security, and, and those sort of things. So depending on your needs, you can actually swap out and use different different container runtimes also. The networking is uh, <coughs> hidden, sort of hidden behind the CNI interface, pretty much like the CRI. So again, Kubelet doesn't really understand how the networking works between your nodes in your infrastructure. Kubelet is able to, to call the CNI interfaces and behind the CNI interfaces, there's some network provider doing the actual implementation for the networking, configuring something on the infrastructure, maybe doing some uh, VXLAN things or whatnot. The sort of nice thing with the CNI interface is that uh, it's actually pretty straightforward, uses a pretty simple JSON schema as the payload for the data. So you can actually go and implement your own network provider pretty easily if you really need, want, or if you want to learn how things work. So <clears throat> the network in, in, the, in the Kubernetes clusters, uh, so there's basically two kind of two layers of, of, of networking in Kubernetes clusters. There's the pod network, so where your workloads talk to other workloads in the, in the cluster. Basically, your containers are talking to other containers in the cluster. So that's the pod to pod communication, and that's, that's really managed by the, the, the CNI, CNI plugin in the, in the system. Then as we have this service abstra abstraction also in, in, in Kubernetes, providing this service level uh, discovery mechanisms and, and whatnot. So the service networking is, is actually implemented as sort of virtual IPs, 
managed by a component called QProxy in the system. How these virtual IPs are implemented? Well, most typically it's based on IP table. Uh, it could use this uh, ah. IP, IPVS yeah. module of the Linux kernel, which is might be a bit faster, but pain in the ass to debug. Well, like IP tables isn't, but it's even more painful to debug than IP tables. So it's pretty damn bad to debug. But usually you, you, you don't really have to dive into those. Uh, but yeah, QProxy is something that runs basically on every single node in the cluster, kind of has a sidekick to the, to the kubelet node ag agent. So whenever you create these services in the, in the Kubernetes API, the kube proxy on, the, on each of the nodes kind of wakes up. So again, a kube, kube proxy is again kind of a glorified while true loop. New service, create IP tables. New service, create IP tables, sleep. That's basically what it does in a nutshell. And if you're running slightly bigger cluster, say 100, 200 nodes in your cluster, there's going to be a shitload of IP table rules, which might actually be a good point to, to switch to the IPVS mode, because that's when things will start to make difference in performance point of view. Lucas. Do you remember where, when did IPVS change to be the default? It's quite... 15? Well, it's quite recent change yeah. anyway. Yeah. It, maybe, maybe 115. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Right. Yeah, maybe. there's a lot of... Lot yeah, of there's a lot of changes and <laughs> moving bits. So, it's, as, as mentioned, it's hard to keep up. Uh, <clears throat> then how the networking on the CNI level is actually implemented, well, there's like 20, 30 different options for the CNI plugin. And there's a lot of differences how these different plugins configured and networking do actually happen. Some work on different layers on the OCI stack, some might work on layer two, some work on layer three, and, and, and so forth. So. <clears throat> when you're planning to, to, to set up your Kubernetes cluster, you probably have a use case for that. Maybe, hopefully. Uh, so you really have to, well, you don't have to, you can of course pick something blindly, but, but uh, I would suggest to, to spend a couple of hours to learn about how these things work so that you can actually select which one suits your infrastructure, your needs the best. Of course, if you're planning to run on uh, Amazon Kubernetes, hosted Kubernetes, well, Amazon made the choice for you. <coughs> the same for DigitalOcean. Well, they use uh, Calico, as far as I remember. No, it's in C -Lail. What? I think it's CLAM. Is it? <coughs> okay. In the first version they rolled out it was Calico. Yeah. I remember no, that. I think I read okay. it the other day. Okay. Well, this bunch of alternatives alternatives is always a good thing, right? It also does mean that you have to make the choice. Which means that you have to learn or at least make an educated guess. That's what we do do in software. <laughs> we make educated guesses. Uh, there's also a cluster-wide DNS service within the cluster. Well, you might actually go and build a cluster without a DNS and it should pa even pass the conformance test as far as I know. But pretty much always you'll have a DNS service within the cluster. 
which means that your workloads can find other workloads pretty easily in the cluster. So when I create Redis, three instances for a Redis, I might create this service abstraction, which gets a IP address and a DNS name within the cluster. So whichever my other microservices, once, when, when they want to talk to Redis, they just use Redis dot something dot cluster dot local DNS address and everything works automatically. <coughs> The community has also built a dashboard, open source of course, uh, which provides you, it's a basically a component that you drop into your cluster, so it's running within the cluster, and it provides you a decent UI to, to sort of see how, how your workloads are running, in which condition your cluster is, and, and so forth. It's like kubectl, it's, it's really generic and fairly basic, uh, but it gives you all the essential things, but the, or like uh, all the basic things, but then for your business, you probably have more specific requirements. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't provide you any means that how much money your service is making. No, exactly. Of course. <laughs> if it would do that, I'd pay a shitload of money to use that. <laughs> Yeah, but it gives you a nice basic overview to the cluster, how things are working. But that's not owned by default in the cluster, so it's something you have to go and set up yourself in, in, into the cluster. All right. What did we, what was the schedule now again? Um, yeah, that's the question. We, we promised food at yeah, 18.30. Okay. Maybe we'll continue a bit more. Right. The 16 clusters up and running, working. So okay, it's that's a good. Slowly, slowly getting up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, I've been already mentioning the uh, uh, term pod quite a few times already. So <clears throat> a pod is sort of the lowest level of, uh, of management and lowest level of work defined in, in, in Kubernetes cluster. So essentially a pod is a single instance of your application. It might be the Redis database, it might be your Node.js application or anything in between. Uh, quite often you define your pod as a, having a single container. But technically speaking, a pod is always at least two containers. On the, if, if I go and, and look how things are implemented on like Docker PS list, for example. You'll see always at least two containers per pod. Uh, but you could have more. I could define as many containers as I need to be run as a pod, like really like a piece in a pod sense. And a uh, piece in a pod is actually a good sort of way of thinking about a pod. So you have a set of containers and some sort of a capsule around those. And what that capsule also means is that, that we share resources between the containers in a pod. One of the resources being networking. So if I go and put my Node.js and Redis into the same pod, which is an architecturally bad idea, don't do it, but if I do it, my Node.js could actually connect to Redis always through localhost. The typical use cases for having more than one container in the same pod are these sort of a sidekick things. So you have your main Node.js application providing some REST API, for example, 
you might have some sidekicks to do asynchronous jobs or, or something. That's always a good sort of a use case for those. Uh, the most important part to understand about pods is also, or one of the important parts is that they are mortal, more, mortal beings. They won't be living long in your cluster. So pods come and go. Don't rely on the fact that I created a pod today. It'll be running like next month. Well, next month is in a couple of days, but probably it won't be still running. There might be something happening in the clusters so that the scheduler, scheduler makes decisions that, okay, get things out of that node, run those in other node. Your node might die. When you're adopting this, maybe with the help of Evicode guys, you're adopting DevOps principles, doing continuous delivery, means that you'll actually deliver maybe many times per day. It means that you deploy new containers, new pods. So they might be pretty short-lived. Uh, then when you have, want to have this more control than just creating these single pods, there's a lot of different sort of abstractions built in, in, uh, in Kubernetes. Um, one of the most important ones is an uh, is uh, object called deployment. So with the deployment, I can say that I always want to have three instances of my Nginx running in the cluster. And they're glorified while true loops with the help of scheduler will ensure that you'll always have three instances running. Well, at least most of the time. There are cases where Kubernetes control plane cannot fulfill your requirement. You run out of capacity, all your worker nodes have died. Kubernetes cannot make mir miracles happen, unfortunately. Uh, a deployment is also gives you a basic way to do a rolling upgrade for your services. Rolling upgrade meaning that, that I go and change this version of Nginx I'm using. By default, Kubernetes won't bring everything down and recreate everything. So it does it in a rolling manner. Bring up a new pod with a new version. Seems to work. Kill one of the old ones. A new one. Kill one of the old ones. So it's a sort of gradual shift towards the new version of your software, whatever you're running in the container. There's various different ways you can actually control it. The usual way is, is to do this rolling deployment. You can do a full recreate, which means that's basically stop everything, recreate everything which is a downtime for your service. But there are ty some types of service which cannot handle anything else than these sort of things. You can pretty easily do sort of blue-green deployments. You can even do canary releases pretty, pretty easily with, uh, with the help of deployments and, and the basic Kubernetes constructs with deployments and services. For these true blue-green canary type of deployments, there are a lot of additional tools around it. We came up with this one new tool, can't remember the name anymore. But there's a few different tools around it to help, help to do that. <clears throat> then when you want to access these sort of a replicated services where you might have multiple instances of the service running in the cluster, that's where you use these service objects to con control and, and configure that access part. So a service provides you a stable, immortal, internal IP address 
within the cluster. Immortal mean, meaning that uh, during the life cycle of that specific service, the IP address of the service will not change. And the IP address given with the service, it's accessible through any node in the cluster. So even if my single pod behind the service is running on node A, I can access the service IP address from any node in the cluster. Basically, it goes through IP table rules, lands in the CNI networking, to the pod to pod networking, and with some magic, however the CNI networking is implemented, depending on which plugin you selected, it's routed to the correct host and maybe some other IP table rules and, and whatnot. There's other types of, uh, of services also, cluster IP being the sort of most important one of those. With the service, you can actually bind your implementation also to cloud provider specifics. There's also a uh, type load balancer, which for example in Amazon environment would go and provision you a ELB or ALB or NLB or whatever LB they are using today. Amazon, Amazon guys are super fast to bring up new XLBs. I think it's NLB nowadays. I'm not sure. <coughs> the most important bit in the service YAML is the selector. So with the selector, we actually select the set of pods that are responding to the cluster IP address. And if this selector doesn't, doesn't really match correctly or doesn't match at all, your service doesn't work. Or if you had a typo in the selector and it matches wrong pods, it's an interesting case to debug, trust me. Why the if this service responds this way? It shouldn't. Well, I had wrong selector. Yeah. So even as fancy as Kubernetes is, it doesn't prevent you from making typos, unfortunately. I pay serious money for a system that prevents me from doing typos. Uh, one way to expose your services out of the cluster uh, is with a configuration object called ingress. So a service, as we had a look on service, uh, a service and the, the service IP address and DNS name is something that's accessible within the cluster only. So services are not exposed outside of the cluster in any way. Uh, Ingress rules are basically set of HTTP routing rules. Rules that you typically would configure on layer 7 load balancers. This virtual host goes to those pods via a service. That path goes to some other services and whatnot, those sort of rules. Those are the two most widely used rules with, with ingress. Uh, with ingresses, you always select the, the set of pods, set of containers that, that would be receiving the traffic. You actually always say that, okay, the backend for this service, uh, backend for this ingress rule is a service, which then sort of hides and abstracts away the set of pods. So there's no direct connection from ingress to a set of pods. There's always a service in between, which is a super nice thing, because you can easily switch the service. For example, if you want to do blue-green deployment, 
that's one point to, to control those. Kubernetes provides us isolation. I mean, not only isolation on the on the workload point of view, things running on container, but also from the cluster control and cluster management point of view. So Kubernetes provides a, a concept called namespace, which is a sort of a with namespaces you can you can sort of slice your cluster. And, uh, and and have this sort of a isolated isolated uh, work environments for different developers, different development teams, and and however ever you want to want to use those. But it's always good idea to to use the namespace namespaces to isolate things. You can even go and isolate your certain application into a namespace. Uh, and what helps you a lot is, is this role-based access control. So you can actually go, I, I can go and configure the cluster so that Lucas can, can, can work only within his own namespace. He cannot see what the other namespaces there even are, and especially cannot touch anybody else's namespace. So you get sort of your own sandbox in a way. But no, this is, Kubernetes by itself and, and like this, and even with namespaces, it's not really a multi-tenant thing. At least if you ask from me, there are other opinions too, but I wouldn't sell my Kubernetes as a multi-tenant thing. I mean, as a hard multi-tenant thing, where I sell, sell a slice to Lucas and another, sell another slice from the same cluster to Oliver. I wouldn't do it. I know there are providers doing it, but in my opinion, that's a bad idea. And just yeah, looking for we're, trouble. We're not there quite yet. Yeah. It takes a couple of years. Yeah. And if we ever yeah. get there, yeah. that's another. Oh my God, it seems that we're almost on time. Yeah, yeah. First time ever, I think, in this meetup group. Yeah. <laughs> you should let me speak more often. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. I yeah, sure. We can take a take a break after this. It's all the this stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's, it works well to to like have a break here and uh, then get hands on. Sorry. Stuff. Was there some question? Oh, okay. At least I have one. All right, all right. Network policies, so are you still going to talk about that part? Network policies? Ah, yes. uh, no. We're not going to go into network policies today. That's another four hours. Okay. Ten minutes to, to, to go and configure network policies and three hours, 45 minutes to debug why they don't work. <laughs> yeah. You saw the example from the port to the service connection and also uh, containers in the port, how they can uh, connect each other with the, with the local. How about port to the port? How it works? How it works? Yeah, yeah. How? Uh, well, a port can talk to any any pod in the cluster. Given that you know what's the address, IP address of the other pod. Okay, so and, and given given the fact that ports might be sh sh really really super short lived, that's a bad idea. So you never use. No, unless I mean, I I do it yes, but usually when I have to debug something, I connect directly to a pod IP address. But I'm doing debugging, so that's somewhat okay-ish. At least that's how I justify it to myself. <laughs> No well, that's the, that, that, that's the sort of backbone of, of, of the networking anyway in Kubernetes. So even, even if I'm <laughs> connecting to these Nginx pods through a service, I'm still essentially doing the pod-to-pod -pod networking. 
the service is just hiding the fact that I don't have to know the IP addresses of the nodes. I don't really have to care anything. I just connect to this service IP address or even with sort of via DNS name. It makes me care less, so which is always a good thing. One question, if you have like a cluster, like let's say MongoDB with multi-cluster or Kafka or something like it, so how do they do the, uh, like how the hosts which would run every one of them, their own like uh, cluster node, how they discover each other? Do, do they have all their own services per pod or how they would know like where are the rest of the clusters? Yep. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to get, give you the classical IT answer. It depends. Uh, it really depends on the implementation details and, and how the, the sort of clustering is built on top of Kafka and, and whatnot. So I, I've seen a bunch of different solutions. I've seen uh, components using a service and basically the, the Kafka manager or, or whatever component it is, it actually sort of discovers the service and then from the service details, it can figure out that, okay, I have these pods. Okay. I've seen also ways where the, the manager or whatever it is managing the cluster uh, creates a service per pod. Like for example, with Rook, uh, Rook is uh, a provider of uh, persistent storage within the cluster. They use super weird way of actually creating a service per pod and even going and changing the fucking service. Excuse my language. Trust me, I have had to debug and work around it quite a few times. So. so there's different alternatives. But I think the most common way is to have a service selecting the set of pods and then maybe some manager script something, reading the service details and from there figuring out that, okay, these are the pods. Because you always, in, in the service details, when you, when you look at the service from the uh, REST API, you'll actually see a list of IP addresses that, okay, these are the IP addresses of the pods that are, at this moment, sort of part of the service. Well, I guess you could explain that quite well with what you explained in the beginning, that Kubernetes doesn't give you the solution, but it's like a... It gives you a build, set of building blocks, yes. Yeah, but luckily, but luckily today, for most of the popular open source things, they're already made building blocks and, and sort of pieces that, that make it easy to run those on Kubernetes, like for Kafka's and Mongo's and whatnot. So if you don't have something ready for Kubernetes, you're maybe looking at wrong. I don't know, but technology selections is always a set of opinions. Let's not go, go there yet. <laughs> Any other good questions? Only good ones. <laughs> well, these were super good. All right. How long break we have? Half an hour? I don't know. Yeah, 20, 25 minutes. It's All right. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Half so half an hour ish, and then after that, we'll continue. Okay. Okay.
Okay. <laughs> Works again. Okay. Don't touch it anymore. Don't touch it. <laughs>
But it's, now it's I mean, yeah, as is, it's actually working now uh, when I spin it up. I can just keep the URL and everything works. <laughs> in the sense that it's actually deployed all that. So, that's why I have one, that's because I have the, the weights, the weight logic. Wait for the service to get all the dollars to write the picture. That's why I have the IP, when I find the application. That takes some time. The first way for this is to be ready for DNS and verification. That's a delete of the release. Because the release refreshes the electric service. Otherwise, it doesn't notice that. Which makes sense.
Does it work? Uh, do you need a microphone? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. I, will, I can... S but we're, we're thinking if this, this works. Um, So everybody should have some kind of this note. There should be 24 on that side. And then so 24 here? Yeah, on, oh. the, on that side. Okay. So two, two per table, basically. Awesome. Um, we have, I, I stopped from provisioning when, when I had uh, around, when I had 30 clusters, but, but some of them are in, uh, random order due to concurrency. So we have 22, 23, and 24 doesn't exist. <laughs> um, so if you, if you could give or scratch those. And then, so basically these, are, everything about uh, under 20 is, is fine. So yeah, I, mm, do we have, okay, well, well, we'll just start and see how it goes. Right, so do, do we have the live stream on? Yes. Yeah, on. perfect. Welcome. Now, now let's start with the fun part, um, with actually doing the, the, first we had the class, uh, and now we have the, the exercise. Um, and yes, as, as we said, uh, we <laughs> with Cloud Native Nordics, um, which is the Meetup Alliance, we have a we can speak two two words about that. Basically, this is everything I need to show. We have this Meetup Alliance with loads of meetups, uh, twelve to be precise, in the Nordic countries, and we help each other with uh, a lot of different things including mm, including coordinating, for example, this roadshow. We had a roadshow last week, uh, starting in Aarhus and ending in Helsinki. Two speakers, Russ Miles and uh, Alexander something, Savotsky, yeah. <laughs> um, we're, we're doing this tour and it went really well. Uh, it was really exciting. Uh, we, we even have, if you're interested in Seeing those talks, they were really good. Uh, you can check out the Cloud Native Nordics uh, YouTube channel for 
to, to get those. Um, we help each other with in, in various other contexts too. For example, share the burden of, of like uh, the boilerplate of, of running a meetup and structure and, and helping each other with, with different things uh, like, like this, aggregating, aggregating data about a meetup. So it's growing fairly, fairly large um, at the moment now. So that's, that's really exciting to see these, these meetups. Um, actually, actually starting gaining momentum here in the Nordic countries too. Um, and one of the ways other than these, which we help each other with, are running workshops. So we, we started seeing that, oh, I'm running in, in one way workshops. And then we had some guys in Aarhus doing it differently. And, and uh, this kind of started talking. Um, wondering if we could do something standardized. We started talking to DigitalOcean and they gave us um, credits to their, to their cloud. So we could, could use, uh, use for, for exactly these, these purposes. And uh, that's what we were supposed to do today. Um, unfortunately, DigitalOcean broke down uh, pretty much from the, this morning. And I don't know if it's still up. Um, but we basically couldn't create any VMs at all. So now I, I really like literally when, when walking in here, I um, contacted the, the CEO of WeWorks. I'm, I've been doing contracting for, for WeWorks for uh, two, three years, something um, from, from my company doing, well, upstream Kubernetes, KubeADM, for example, and, and the cluster lifecycle and other stuff. Um, these things I do completely on my own, or what, what to say, as independent. Um, but I, I knew they had quota in, in Google Cloud, unless, uh, unlike me. So, so now, literally, while Yussi was speaking here, uh, we got to provision 30 clusters um, just like that on, on their behalf. And uh, we're very thankful, <laughs> thankful for, for that. Um, they do a lot of cloud native stuff. It's a cloud native startup doing, have donated a couple of projects to CNCF, um, started with WeaveNet, basically as a container networking, one of the CNI providers, and then continued into many different areas. Um, I did a project uh, with, with them uh, kind of this year, actually, and, and another Finnish guy, too, from the military. Uh, which was called We Ignite. So we, we created a virtual machine implementation, basically. So you're used to that virtual machines take a minute or two or three, five, ten to provision. And you have to manually click in like boot day so and then click in different things. Uh, with this Ignite project, uh, which I got, well, which I invented, uh, it takes a second or two. Uh, from from booting the VM to, to everything running, so they and they they were happy to to do that kind of thing, and now we have also other things with regards to Kubernetes, so that you can spin up a cluster in maybe a minute, uh, ten node on your on your local laptop, uh, with where the each node are actually a virtual machine using this thing, so all, all those kinds of things. Um, they're also donated uh, Weave Flux. Uh, into CNCF the the other month, I don't remember, August maybe, uh, which is the, the way to do GitOps. And GitOps is, is kind of the, the mantra they're, they're selling um, and, and promoting in the community. And actually, this workshop thing, workshop CTL that I, that I created is, is also built upon GitOps. Uh, so what is this about? I wrote. Basically, a couple of days ago, <laughs> I wrote a tool called Workshop CTL. It's open source. I would, um, if you want to, to make this better after, after this, uh, please do. Um, it's, it's really early. I published this tonight, uh, or like last night, uh, literally, on GitHub. With this, basically, that's what we're all using today. You do Workshop CTL Gen. So, which is going to generate, well, something. Now I have 30 clusters. Uh, and uh, so, so, manifest for 30 clusters. And then, workshop CTL apply 
then, well, supposedly uh, uh, creates the clusters actually in DigitalOcean, but now I quickly just pivoted to, to create them in, in Google Cloud instead. Um, and uh, this has uh, the nice benefit of also being GitOps, uh, GitOps native, so that if we go here into clusters, um, like could even it would even be fun to, to try this. Here is here is all the source code uh, for this workshop. So, but if I if I would go here and press edit, I could actually edit one of yours live environment. Um, so that kind of that kind of stuff this this all is running on. Um, and contributions are, are very welcome after after this once we've got some uh, standardization. What it does, each one of you, hopefully, I think we're 30 here. Uh, if not, some of you, one or two will um, compare. Mm, have, but pretty much each one has uh, one cluster with one node running now in Google. And um, this, this means that you have your unique environment to, to use and to break. If <laughs> hopefully not, but, but like you, you, you're, you have full admin access to all of the things, uh, which means be responsible, but also now you can actually do stuff. Uh, you're, you're not limited in, inside of one little box. Um, and what you're going to get uh, as a UX, user interface is a Visual Studio Code instance running in the browser. So the only requirement you need on your uh, laptops are Chrome. Uh, I tried Firefox, it kind of works, but Chrome, yeah, is, is better. It has already, in the terminal, it has already Helm, kubectl, Docker, other useful tools pre-installed. And uh, it's accessible on a public endpoint with Let's Encrypt certificates and all that kind of stuff. So now this is wrong because I had to uh, add to add a <laughs> had to add a GKE in there to to make it um, not conflict with the stuff I already had el elsewhere. So now the first thing that you will do is you have your uh, your note there about your number. If you have, it's with zero padding. So if you have a one, it's, well, one, a zero, one. Uh, and using that URL, should, you should be able to access your instance. Um, and hands up if you have problems. We have a couple of instructors to, to help. And the password is Kubernetes rocks, in one word, lowercase. Awesome. Uh, there was a 26 available, but oh. in the list, I think. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, all right. um, 25 to 27. All right. Yes. All right. Let's uh, just wait a moment. I will check. Yeah, so Kubernetes Fox. We will, yeah, we will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we, we first had thought about doing doing 40 before. So it had already provisioned some, like, randomly in the, the range. Yeah. Yeah. We will just see whoever hasn't won and yeah, yeah. give, yeah. It's a, it's a dot there and a dash. So no, so cluster dash uh, one and then dot g. It's a, oh yes, and then oh yes, and then a dash there between GKE and workshops. Ah. Workshop CTO. No, uh, between GKE and workshop CTO. Yeah, it's it's harder than it it ought to be now that I just yeah. did some random random URL before. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, you didn't get one yet. Yeah. Uh, 
because yeah. uh, um, it's let's okay if we share that. So okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll wait a moment. We will see which which ones are not used, and then give one of the environments. Did we have any free environment? If 23 doesn't exist. No, no. Okay. It no, it doesn't. 29? 29, I don't think either. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this, yes. Here is 16. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see what's that a free one? Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, is there anyone who hasn't a Visual Studio code? Uh, Visual Studio code instance now? Awesome, yeah, then I counted correctly. So in front of you, you will see Visual Studio Code. Um, normally, as it would would look like if you were running it, you you were running it on your desktop in Electron. Um, now it's just the same, but but served over well over HTTP. Up here, the normal uh, file browser, and down here, uh, which you will get by clicking. Uh, terminal and new terminal or something. So it's like three, um, how, do, how do you say it? Uh, I will. I will. Activate one of these to, to show, to make it a bit clear, more clear. Yeah, so, so up there, um, or yeah, actually the first thing. Um, the first w thing would be to click the open folder, um, if you already aren't logged into a default folder. And, and here it's like, when in the open folder, uh, you go to home, coder, and project. So open folder and home, co home coder, and project. And now, if you are in home, coder, and project, that folder, you should see uh, folders one, pod info, and two, Node.js app and some readme files and stuff like that. It's empty. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, nothing. <coughs> okay, that's that's where random. <coughs> okay, well, it's something. Yeah, if you click project and then OK. Yeah, but it's, um, well, the, I mean, we can solve it easily by just git clone this. <laughs> so, because <laughs> this is the folder that was supposed to be downloaded automatically. So, github.com, cloud Nordics workshop CTL. So, what's the 
what do you should have in the folder? Uh, this. Yes. yes. Like, I will do that. <coughs> oh. Much whatever, well, but maybe not that. Yes. <coughs> Turn our, Okay, so you, you open folder home coder project and then go to the terminal and uh, git clone this Cloud Native Nordics workshop CTL. What? You say rather than because you don't have your SSH key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, use the uh, HTTPS like variant. Yeah, yeah. Like that. <laughs> Did it work? Yeah. yeah. I'm just cool. wondering if you need to dot git anymore. No, probably not. Yeah. Do we think we have can proceed? Not yet. Awesome, yes. Yep. Yeah. This is not really response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was able to close. Yes, perfect. Okay, great, just reload. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. but just to write something. So while well, now is a good time to start looking at kubectl and basic commands of that kubectl version, uh, for example, will show you what, what version of the server and client you have. kubectl get pods will show you the pods. Uh, if you uh, add dashes all namespaces, you will actually see something. If you don't, you won't see something because we have, don't have anything there yet. So, like that. Git clone. Git clone, yes. Uh, spaces between the words, 
Yes, now it should work. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. No. No, in here. Yeah. There we have it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. And now, now you can do, for example, cube CTL version. Okay. And there, as it says in the different. <coughs> is it cube CDL or cube cuddle? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't. I don't have an official opinion. Those are all like pods that you have already created in the. In this cluster. Yes, yes. The, because this this environment that you're running on now is actually <laughs> a pod in the cluster. So you're you're executing in a pod in that <laughs> Kubernetes cluster. And all the all the certificates and load balancing is done in Kubernetes uh, itself. So the pods that you see there, if you kill them, then connection is gonna be shut and well <laughs> you're <laughs> you're not getting back in. But, but like yeah. those that I'm seeing are that is created, like the one I'm working on, yes. or is it all of those? No, no, it's, it's your, each and every one of you has uh, your unique cluster. Okay. Everybody has one uh, cluster that they own. Uh, and the, the pods that you see there and the resources and everything, you have full control over them, and you, you have direct connection to the API server, so you can, um, you can do whatever whatever is needed um, for this workshop and also try different things. And uh, yeah, there's no risk of, of you breaking everybody else's stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. How much resources is it for each one of those clusters or? So in what sense resources? Like, is there some resources allocated to each Worker. cluster? Or yes. Or? Yeah. Yes, one, one machine. Okay. Yeah, one machine, four CPUs, eight gigabytes of memory, I think. Like yeah. Sharing resources, you know. No. Okay. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah, you, every, every, each and every one of you has one uh, Kubernetes master, which, is, which provide, uh, Google or Digital Ocean provides. And then everybody has one unique VM, which, where the, the worker is running. And as we've scheduled a, a pod with code server, it ha lands on exactly that worker. So you, the, the stuff you see there is, is actually executing exa exactly on that, that one thing. And you can even do Docker PS. <laughs> Docker PS to see what's, what's executing there. And yes, it's possible to shoot yourself in the foot with that one, but. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is that if, if you do that, you only shoot your own leg. You yes. Everybody else's leg, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I even have it, had it on the next oh. slide, yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Yeah, so kubectl explain is useful for when you don't know the schema of an object. It can tell you from the, the open API reference uh, specification, it can tell you a lot of information of, about what it's needed. If you ever think about like, oh, what is, what is a pod spec? Then do kubectl explain pod dot spec and it will tell you. Uh, and describe nodes, so, so get uh, lists the objects. So uh, kubectl get and the resource name lists uh, all those resources in that particular namespace. The dash n flag lets you select the namespace. Um, describe has more uh, human friendly information and, and summarizes related um, resources too in, in that same, uh, same output. And, um, and then we have loads of other, other things we'll, which we will test now. So running our first uh, workload with kubectl run. Uh, this is not 
And, and yes, also it should be said before we start doing stuff for real, this is not how you would do it in real life. Absolutely not. This is explicitly for, <laughs> for demoing and learning. Uh, kubectl run is not something you should use uh, for real. Neither may be kubectl apply that we'll use later. Uh, you should use some kind of um, policy driven and uh, automated way of, of talking to your cluster. Uh, we, it, it's, a, it's a saying that, that kubectl is a new SSH. So in the same way as it's, it might be an anti-pattern to all the time SSH in and like do apt get upgrade uh, in your VMs, it's not a good idea to, to have as your main workflow that you kubectl apply things whenever you feel for it uh, in production. That's, <laughs> that's not a good thing. So, <laughs> so instead, <laughs> it worked in testing. <laughs> uh, so in, instead, um, the, these are for learning. Um, and through these, first we'll start with doing imperatively. Uh, so we'll, we'll try kubectl run in various forms, kubectl um, exec and, and those kinds of commands. Then we'll start, uh, or we'll switch over to writing YAML files. And um, lastly, if we have time, uh, we have some, some uh, a small exercise, uh, which is pretty much end to end, but I don't think we'll, we'll have time for it today, but maybe, maybe some other, uh, the next time we run this. So kubectl run pod info. Uh, so this is gonna create a deployment, uh, which is called pod info. Uh, it's gonna use this image. Um, uh, Stefan Pran is actually working at WeWorks too. Uh, He's made a good sample Go web server with loads of good features for uh, demoing. Um, and so that's the image and the tag. Then replicas three. We obviously want to, to scale this like it's going to be huge, three replicas. Um, and then we say expose port 9898 uh, because the HTTP server uh, listens on 9898. So this is going to yield us a deployment and a service. And um, they, go, they will both uh, share the same app equals pod info la uh, label and that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, have everybody written this? It's, it's a f I understand if it's uh, some kind of well, uh, typing. Uh, so it can take, take a while. Or are you done? Can I proceed? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, no, no, no. what's, sorry? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. So, but if you, if you have done this, uh, you do kubectl get deployments, uh, or kubectl get services, or kubectl get all, whatever. <laughs> uh, and, and you will see that your, um, your workload is running. Pod info should be, should be running there. And, um, And there you can examine, uh, examine them more. So, uh, like this pod info is the uh, deployment name. Yes, like the deployment name is this. Yeah. It's, and then and, and yes, and the yes, name. and the service name. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So this is this kubectl run is just a, a really. It's kind of an alias. Yeah, so alias. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, if I change this pod info here, it would change the deployment name or not? No, it would create a new one. Oh, okay, but, but yeah, so if, if you're not running this image to create a, 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 a deployment with the name that I put here. Yes, so yes, yes, okay. exactly. So if you would say pod info two here, then it you would create another one uh, with that name. And one, one, one important thing to remember is that. Uh, in Kubernetes, all these configuration objects, every one of those always have a name. The name has to be unique within a namespace. So within a namespace, the name is unique thing for a specific coin yes. of an object. So I still, still can have a pod info name service yeah. and a so you deployment. Also, you, if you don't want to write the backspaces, you don't have to. You can write everything in the, on the same line.
Yes, that's a good point. I will proceed. Um, so the next thing we will do is, well, I already kind of said it, like get deployments, pod services, you, sh you should see your, uh, your stuff running. Uh, yes. Another thing which might be useful is uh, kubectl logs. And uh, this flag adds the timestamps for you. And then this match, uh, matches based on the uh, label. So your label is now run equals pod info. And uh, that will, uh, it will find, it will show the logs of the pod that has a label run equals pod info. So then you should see some kind of message, JSON message of, of pod info starting or something like that. Sure. No, no. Uh, should be, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's P O D info. Yeah. <laughs> so you can you can do yeah you can do pod info two or something and and correct it here. Yes. Uh, okay, that's if you do kubectl uh, get pods, what does it say? Uh, get uh, and then space pods, yes. Yes. Oh, you have, uh, there's something wrong with the, uh, can you show? Normal, like the method that doesn't work. Like mm. That's the first one, I guess. So it's like maybe you delete again both and then service and then sure. deployment again. Yes. I'll just <laughs> <laughs> Oh that seems strange. If we if you do kubectl describe deployment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Deploy, uh, just deploy. Yeah. Mm. Or dis uh, describe pods, maybe. I, I don't know why. Why there is? I didn't see anything. Mm. Uh, that is probably the most random error message I've seen. <laughs> Exec expose executable find not in found in path. Um, Uh, 
Let's just try some. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no idea why why that um, three one two didn't work for you. Because like the error message expose doesn't isn't in path. Oh yeah, now I see. yeah now I know now I know yes yes. Uh, see so you run this first time like that. Yeah. That is that is uh, yeah yeah right 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 yes yes. So yeah so it actually. Yes. So if you, 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 even if you give wrong command. It yes, because this this means like uh, dash dash means uh, stop interpreting commands here or stop interpret flags here and everything else is the command. So now it tries to run this image, but it runs the binary expose uh, okay. within. Yeah. So if if you now uh, delete both deployments and services. Kubectl delete deployments and services and pod info and pod info two, and then run that command again with the right expose. Then it should be working. Yes. Uh, yes. Kubectl delete and then deployment pod info and pod info two. Yes. Hey, okay. Yeah. The first command when you're running yes. the curl with the pod info is like referencing the, the name. Yes. Of the, yes. So it's like w w how that's supposed to be working. I mean, like the, it, it does work or no, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, I mean like the referencing by the uh, DNS. Yes. Then it works fine. But like I, I'm just like how this should work. Uh, it actually know the where it should know even the pod. Yes, it, it does. It, it should know it from the. Um, from the Etsy resolve conf uh, search. If you do cat Etsy resolve conf, you, it should be in the search domains. Uh, using. Okay. Um, did did you get it to work? Yeah. The but the pod info doesn't work. Yeah, I I heard that. Yeah, Maybe that's, it's I yeah. Have yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know what it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, because cause now that um, that's the thing I forgot. I I moved the the code server to to be in another namespace. So now we actually need to fully resolve that. Say that. It's in this workload and in this namespace, because we're not in the same. We're not sharing the same namespace anymore. Yeah, yeah. those kinds of things you you don't find before you <laughs> before you run into them. <laughs> I mean, just a software engineer, right? So we have run VS Code on the server itself. So I was like, can you actually resolve domains from outside of Kubernetes? No, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, cool. It works. Real nice. Mm -hmm. Are we ready to go for next next thing? <laughs> I don't know. So the next thing for that we could do is uh, let's go big and go with five replicas. Kubectl scale, deployment pod info, and dash dash replicas five will we'll make that happen. Go big or go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're crazy, you could even like do more than five. Try. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you might just get break the cluster, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Really? 
Ja. <laughs> and the kubectl get endpoints. Uh, the endpoints of a service are uh, represents the, the set of pods that are healthy in that moment. So, so the the IPs uh, IPs and port of the pods that uh, that are healthy for the service to load balance to. So with that, you see basically the pod IPs, um, pod IPs for the service uh, who, has, who has a matching label. Uh, I should like use that port info right here. Uh, yes, and for the exec command here, so kubectl exec is is pretty interesting. It it opens uh, a, a web socket, right? Uh, yeah. So yeah, a web socket to the API server through as a client, and then the API server opens another web socket into the kubelet, the node agent, which then does uh, byte forwarding uh, both ways to the actual like inside of the C group in the container. So you actually end up having a, a session inside the, the, the container that you're running, uh, a virtual terminal. I, I think the easiest way to think of that is, is like taking an SSH into a running container. Yeah, that, that's the, the, the moral, <laughs> yeah. moral story of it. And here, like, replace this with whatever uh, the pod, I, I, pod name actually is. Uh, it's, it's not going to be that, but you have to choose one of them. You can't exec into 10 pods at the same time. So actually, the IP addresses that the pods are getting are from the same namespace where the, like this VM is? The, uh, the IP addresses, yes. So like a key, like curl by the IP address also? Uh, yes. So, so the, the networking in, is handled by in Google's case, I think they even connect like pretty much physical. <laughs> uh, not not maybe, but they have they have their own like very sophisticated networking. Uh, in this case, um, it's it's on the same same uh, node, so it's it's super fast. It's like not localhost fast, but but nearly because it doesn't the packets never trans uh, travel any further, um, but. They could do to have the CNI networking is set up. They could be on different hosts and uh, still connect to each other. But yes, they get the same. They get addresses from the same subnet because every node has. Uh, so like yeah, twenty-four probably. Yeah. Yes. That's one of it, that's the node itself? No, it's, uh, it's a pod. It's a pod. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're execu Visual Studio is, uh, is executing in a pod, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Which is, which is really interesting that you have, you have an IDE in a pod, and then that actually has a new terminal in that pod. And then you can exec into other containers on that node. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. And also, uh, <laughs> that that needs to be said. Like now, you do have now. I've given this pod where Visual Studio is executing cluster admin access for you to be able to do anything. But obviously, that should never be done uh, in a in a real scenario, because uh, because then your workload can do get root access for everything else which is not the best idea ever. One of the worst ideas ever.
So I, I think we should be able to move to the next. Is there anyone that hasn't still like done the exercises here? Then we'll move to the, the next part. You can, um, you can clean up after yourself. Uh, <laughs> using kubectl delete. Uh, kubectl delete de deployment and service pod info. We'll do that for you. to go into the next stage of this so now now we've now we've done this uh, imperatively uh, which means that we have used the CLI to do all the stuff for us um, this has many limitations but for one we we have very 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 little things we can actually describe even using key value flag pairs uh, we can't describe more complex structures with just image equals blah. Uh, so that's one of the parts that we need to go declarative. A couple of, of a small background on the, how the API works. Um, everything is an API object. It's very important. Uh, Kubernetes has 100 right, resources, approximately. Uh, Yes, out of the box. I, I think like the less than 100, like 80, maybe yeah. 80, 80 to 100, something in in, in some something in in, in that uh, area, and um, and these um, you can't all not all of those hundred of objects uh, have the same stability level, so that's why we <laughs> that's why we need to have API versions, but then uh, they can't be in the same group either, really. Because you can't just have like one one version and, and move object between these these. Uh, you have to also segregate them in a group, so where they belong. For example, deployments and <coughs> and uh, some jobs. Uh, no, not jobs. Uh, <laughs> deployments, for example, belong to the apps group, and jobs belong to the batch group, for example. So there, <coughs> in that sense, the API group evolves over time with, with the same similar um, amount of types and, and that kind of stuff. So, so this, this kind of, this triple uh, of, of group, version, and kind is really important in Kubernetes. And um, unfortunately, we have uh, this <laughs> field, API version, and kind is existent and required in every Kubernetes object. And uh, unfortunately, for legacy reasons, we don't have both group and version here. It should be, for example, apps slash v1 uh, is the, the for deployment. So apps slash v1 and deployment, for example. But for the first type that were in core, we didn't at that time, think Kubernetes would be so big, so we know we don't need any groups. Uh, we just have one group. 
which didn't scale at all. So, so this, is, this is like legacy for, it should be core slash one, v1. Um, anyways, with apart, apart from this v1 exception, everything is group name slash v1 in this API version field. And everything in kind says what, what kind of resource is this. Um, and um, the different stability levels here, we, we see that we have, for example, v1, v beta 1, v alpha 1, v alpha 2, v2 alpha 1, all these uh, different things. The major number here says, well, what version it is. And if it has a suffix of beta or alpha, um, it means that uh, it's, it hasn't reached v1 yet. It's before v1. So alpha is disabled by default, can be buggy, can be changed pretty much however, uh, in whatever way. And it can also even be removed in some future version. Uh, beta are tested and uh, considered pretty, pretty stable. Like we, we know what direction we're going, but some small fields and, and some small schema changes, renames can, can still happen. Uh, they might be enabled by default and stable, that doesn't change. Uh, new things can be added, but not backwards. Incompatible changes can't happen. So, just, a, just yes. a small note on the, on the stability level. <coughs> it really depends on uh, who provides that definition of that object. So it's, a, it's a, usually a human interpretation what is stable and what is not stable. Yes. I've seen a lot of things breaking <laughs> in the one beta one in not on these core Kubernetes things, but I'm looking at your sort manager. Yes. <laughs> so so like well well we won't get to it uh, today, but you can make your custom types uh, that look exactly like this and are even stored in the Kubernetes as a database. Uh, this is called a custom resource definition and is one of the most powerful things in Kubernetes as a platform platform. Uh, so now you can use Kubernetes to build platforms on top. And you do this by using the Kubernetes uh, API servers, kind of a database for the single source of truth of, 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 for your cluster. So let's say I have a, a MySQL I, I can create a MySQL type or Maria, Maria D, DB type uh, using my, my own group. Well, I could make a Luxus group and, and then like version three and then uh, Maria DB cluster. And then inside of that, I could specify what the cluster looks like and have some, some uh, reconciliation, uh, reconciliation loop uh, to operate on this. So if the user creates Maria DB clusters, um, in the API using, using this kubectl create, then the operator would, would notice the, the, re, the uh, reconciling loop would notice that, oh, I, have, I should do something. And then it starts MariaDB clusters in the way I want. So we can go from human, humans that operate uh, software to software that operates software in that sense. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, not too excited about that, but yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So, and, and then, then if, if you make your own API type, then, then it's your human interpretation and, and but, but at least Kubernetes is very, very, very uh, strict about these guidelines. So you, you really can't break this. Um, and this leads us to that every object must have API version, which has the group and the version, the kind, and metadata name, namespace, and UID. UID is filled in automatically, so you don't have to think about that. But as Yulsi said, name needs to be unique inside of that namespace. Or for different, uh, for some types, uh, some types are cluster scope, so that um, they don't have a namespace, and then they are unique, have a unique name over the whole cluster. So this is we already looked at the pod. This is one example of, of just this. Uh, this required information. Uh, we also showed 
this is reiteration of, of the pod we saw earlier. We have API version kind, metadata, its name, its uh, namespace. Now you were operating in the default namespace. Um, your name was pod info for the deployment. And uh, the specification, so we have two important things. The, the specification, the spec, uh, says what the desired state of the application is. Uh, for example, three replicas. When you, when you submit the thing to Kubernetes, the object to Kubernetes, you say, I want three replicas. But at that very moment, you don't have three replicas, most likely. You have zero. But Kubernetes will reconcile and apply uh, or um, add to status, which is, you don't see it here yet. Um, but actually, yeah, a, a little bit later. Uh, so it will apply to, to status uh, what's the actual state. And that update, that's updated over time, too, as state progresses. Um, yeah, so normal YAML there. You can express it in JSON as well. No, or more, <coughs> not weird, but uncommon types like KSONnet and JavaScript and uh, like all, all, all these different, there's, there's a bazillion uh, different ways to express this. But like, we'll, we'll stick to YAML and JSON and, and plain Kubernetes types because that is what everybody can use. So this is, spe uh, status is managed by Kubernetes, so automatically filled in, and spec is what you own. And then Kubernetes only, like, goal in life is to, to make these two equal. Here we have an example. I submit my pod, and if I do then uh, kubectl get pods, I will see that this is what actually Kubernetes has filled in. Yeah, this, at this time, it, I, this pod transitioned to ready and was initialized and all that kind of stuff. And it can even be different controllers doing these different conditions. It doesn't have to be the same, uh, same actuator. Labels are very uh, important. Um, use, they are used for, for selecting things, describing, grouping. Um, but not for guaranteeing uniqueness. So that you can have like app equals nginx or app equals my fancy app or something like that. And your neighbor might have the same label. You, you can't like, you can't guarantee that. Um, <coughs> and uh, yeah. Your pods can have labels, your nodes can have labels, your services, your every Kubernetes object basically can have labels attached to it, uh, which can, and they can then be used for searching. For example, you had the um, logs command, which used label equals run equals pod info or something. Then you, you matched that pod using the label, because you didn't, I didn't know when putting the slides what the name was going to be, because it's automatically generated. So here we have one example, app equals nginx, app equals prod, uh, n equals prod. Uh, but then the important, uh, like the interesting thing is that you can select on them. So if you have nodes of certain types, then you can just add labels to them. And when you then schedule your pod, say that I own, this workload should only uh, be scheduled to nodes with GPU, uh, NVIDIA GPUs as one e very simple example. Uh, then it's guaranteed to happen there. And if there is no such thing, no such node, then it won't be scheduled at all. There's also more advanced uh, selectors. It doesn't have to be equality-based directly. It can also operate on, for example, in. And uh, now I don't remember all of them, but there's a, there's a set of, of, of these operators that you can use, the, the really common ones. Um, right. So that's the, that's the theory. Now we get to action again. Very nice. So to avoid that you have to write all of these things yourself, which will take some time, um, we will use a small trick. So with kubectl create, we have the imperative. You used kubectl create pretty much right away. Uh, 
and uh, or the other <laughs> the other minute. Um, it's an alias for run, basically. And um, here we're going to use that because it can create many different. It's a template for many different things. But we're going to do a dry run, so we're not applying it to the cluster. And this dry run, we're outputting the YAML of it. So if if I do kubectl create dry run oyaml and pod, I would get the the default empty pod uh, specification out. And this is why you, uh, I'm wondering if I can share these slides actually through meetup comments. I could do I, I could do that in a moment, but um, <coughs> that's why we're going to create. To avoid that I have to type this much in the slides, create an alias in bash <laughs> um, called kubeyaml. So that when, whenever you execute kubeyaml, it's actually going to do this, uh, which is it's going to like output the, <coughs> the, default, uh, the defaults for, for this specific resource. I will actually. Also, the decent editors like Visual Studio Code, for example, they have a lot of plugins for Kubernetes. And some of those plugins actually provide you this auto completion feature for these YAMLs to yeah. make your life 100% easier. I actually have that installed already. Okay. So, there. Uh, now I'm looking at some, some random things here. So for example, if I hover over API version, later when you see this, you will see more information about it. And this comes from the Kubernetes specifications. It's like this, uh, let's see, it was YAML from, from Red Hat. Like it had, like, it had a, a configuration option where you could set YAML schemas, and then I used grab the one from Kubernetes. So it's, it's pretty nice. Um, so yeah, I now shared the, the, these slides in Meetup comments. So if you want to go copy paste even, uh, feel free to do so. Um, but this is the, the alias for kubeyaml. So you can, so we, we reduce the time of needed for writing <laughs> YAML. And, also, like, we're not supposed to write this in real life, write this a lot of YAML. Uh, then <laughs> uh, in, in some, some real environment, probably you would have, have some, um, you would make life easier for you and, and generate something which is more high level and then which then operates on that and makes, spits all, out all of the YAML. Um, but this is, this is for the purpose of exercise. And uh, meanwhile you do that, you could also make a new folder or something, ju just, just whatever folder in your workspace <coughs> that is empty so that you can add all your, and CD there, so you can add all your Kubernetes manifests in that one directory. And demo to minus n default because why nobody has no, but end. but I actually gonna do the, like everything in the demo nature. Oh, okay. So okay. the first yeah, thing yeah, is, yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, otherwise it would be yeah. a bit.
I don't know why it's... Uh, oh, I don't know either. This one, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so I... So <coughs> now, like... What, what I'm supposed to do when I'm using yes. this alias, but yes. do I need like a name of a resource or...? Yes, yes, so we're going to use that in a moment. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. What? Yes, yes. So, the, is, is there anyone who hasn't pasted this yet? Cubiamo, okay. Great. So, and you have created a director, empty directory to use. And also, also change the directory into, into that. So we can uh, create it. It, it. Now here I workshop too. It could be whatever, whatever you like. But an empty directory. <laughs> that is that is immoral. So how we will use this cube YAML alias is. <coughs> Like this. So this basically translates into, if we would read it out, kubectl create namespace. So that is the, the kind. And then what names should it have? It should have demo as the name. So kubectl create namespace demo. And we will either you copy paste it into a file or you uh, pipe stream it uh, using, using that character. Um, but the, the the idea here is to create this kind of similarly looking uh, YAML file in your new empty directory without having to write that much. Because <laughs> it, it gets, now it's, this is easy, but then the deployment and like other stuff <laughs> becomes a bit, bit more work. Do you have namespace? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Nice. So the spec and start is like should be removed or it can stay just as it can stay. Um, so now now it fills in spec and status. Uh, it for a name in the case of the namespace it doesn't have any. So it doesn't do any harm, but it isn't better either. So re you can do either way. Um, but but some of the objects have just defaulted stuff which uh, isn't very important. Okay, it seems like most of you are done. Um, the next thing we're going to do is to create similarly a deployment, kubectl create deployment image, the same image that you used earlier, Stefan Prodan podinfo, and we call it podinfo, the deployment again.
So this will generate something, something along these lines for you. And now, now the alias kind of pays off. <laughs> And you can see that all of these, as we specify in the kube.yaml alias, all of these are uh, new resources created are put in the demo namespace automatically, uh, which we're going to use for putting all our stuff in for, for the reason of exercise. You can already put the replicas to tree, if you like, or something else, some random number. <laughs> 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 and we can also we can also see these app equals pod info labels being consistently used across the different uh, across the different parts this part here is then for the deployment this is like what uh, the pod template is so all pods are going to be created with this from based of this template um, so this is always like by default using up the label the key label um, when using kubectl they'll create yes um, you can use Whatever you want for for your things, but, but it it's a very yeah super common pattern yeah. And, yeah. So is it like the standard? It's it's pretty much a standard, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I I I'd almost call it like a best practice. Yeah. Yeah, it's like as long as you don't start having you call every app app equals web app. <laughs> then, <laughs> then you're in trouble, but. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, it's yeah, it's a best practice. But is it also like if you think like if you would have like engines and you would have multiple engines, is the point of like changing the key of the label the way to be able to run multiple ones with the different labels in a way so you can select on them? Yeah, you can. You can. Mm. Kind of yeah. like it will exactly. You can. You can really mi mix and match with these. Like no, the normal case, everything we display here is going to be like. We have a deployment, and the service matches all the endpoints of the deployment, all the, the pods of that managed by that, that deployment. But the, the power of using these labels is that you can have many really advanced, like you can have five deployments, and you um, then one service matches a third of those, and like one service matches some other part. And, and, um, and for these blue green deployments, yeah. you could have a service that matches app equals pod info version one and it might actually match also version two yeah. mm. so you can do these canary type of deployments with these canary type i mean it's yeah it's not really perfect in any sense but but it gives you a easy way to do it yeah kind of baby steps <laughs> yeah the Okay, seems like we can proceed. So the service, pretty much the same thing here. Uh, we say that we want a service where you get uh, an internal cluster IP and uh, that matches, again, these app equals pod info uh, pods. It's called pod info and here we say that the service itself, the service IP, is accessible on port 80 but it load balances to the pod IPs of 98, 98. This is because the pods themselves, the app in the pod, listens on 98, 98. So port is for the service, and target port is for the pods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
objects um, they have the use that you kind of give to them for for pods it's kind of built in when with the service and pod um, but for example and for replica sets and deployments too but for deploy the, the most higher level objects there isn't like really so like service there's nothing managing a service um, there isn't like a predefined uh, use for the labels for themselves um, but like for example for service do you need to provide it if it doesn't provide any additional info like do you really need to label it no you don't it's just like the it's a common it's a, it's a standard pattern yeah, yeah, yeah. but but yeah 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 no no yeah no you don't you don't need to there's there's no there's nothing that actually like uh no uh, no so those are used, but that is not used, but just to keep consistent. Because uh, this is used for the deployment to know what pods it manages, and this sets the, that for the pods. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more like when you, when, you start doing, when you start doing these operators and, and start using Kubernetes as a set of building blocks that you start needing it. Uh, before, before that, when running just applications one-off, not really. Okay, um, are we ready to, to continue into... So now we have a, a small part of... Uh, now we have created the, the most basic uh, objects, and now we will configure the pod. So inside of the deployment, we have a pod template, and um, we will we will configure the containers. Well, we just have one. We can have multiple containers in a pod, but in this case, we don't. Um, now we will configure the container. Um, if you are familiar with with how uh, containers have entry point and command, entry point is kind of always executed when you even though you add something after it uh, when running the, the container, some, some argument. But um, when you add a C in Docker file, CMD, directly if you run the container with some argument, it completely overrides that CMD. So entry point, you can think of entry point as stronger. Uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say it. Um, but anyways, we're not going to use these, but it might be of, of use. Um, today, we're not going to use this. But this is probably of use if you're actually running, running some command line um, tool inside of your, um, 
your container and you need to configure it using different different things. Uh, for example, like just taking um, a real world example here in, in the the clusters. Um, let's see. Where were I thinking? Here. So here we're running um, this external DNS, which have which is the, the daemon that have created all of these A records for you. Um, to load balance to the right, or to point to the right place. And here we have args. So I say to, um, to external DNS, where the entry point is the binary itself, uh, which we don't change, and then the arguments to the binary are these flags. This is uh, how, to, how to think of it. And like now we, we say that manage this own cheeky workshop CTL that you're using right now and like provider Google and etc 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 so that can be useful to know and um, what we yeah so one important thing you understand is that, that for those who've been working with Docker so in Docker we have entry points and commands yes in Kubernetes, the command is the same as entry point in Docker. Oh, yes, that's a good point. <laughs> it does. That confused me for a while. Just wanted to note that. Yes. And our argument is CMD. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I didn't come up with that name. <laughs> yeah. So this is Docker's entry point, and this is uh, Docker's command. Anyways, <laughs> the next thing which is more relevant and what we're going to use here uh, today is that we're going to, there's three different qualities of service in Kubernetes. So there's the, the weakest one is best effort. And that's basically, you, you, put, your, um, you put your workload out there, and if, if there are more higher uh, prioritized uh, pods, your, your workload might get kicked out. It might get evicted. OK? Uh, the, the middle one is guaranteed. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. The middle one is burstable. And uh, in burstable, you have set um, um, you have set a request, for example, like this, uh, 32 megabyte. But then, then you have some higher, like this. Then you have a higher limit, which means that when scheduling, this is going to be the, the thing that it takes to, into account. It, it like allocates 32 megabytes for you. Uh, when, when the scheduler bin packs all the stuff on the node. But it's, Kubernetes is not going to kill your, uh, or like out of memory, your um, pod until it hits this limit. And uh, that's, the, that's the middle one. And then the, the highest quality of service is when they, they are equal. So if it's like this, if they're equal here, the, it has the highest quality of service where it's guaranteed, the, the class is called guaranteed, that I, I asked for 32 and I can exactly use 32 megabytes of memory. And then I'm guaranteed to get that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's that. And th it might not seem like the, the most important thing and it's not maybe the most important thing on day one, but when you have like thousands of applications and you can't like keep count of them anymore, you're going to get very random outages if you don't take this into account. So if you have the slides up, uh, you can copy and paste this into, into the, um, 
the pod. So in, in the container, this is, again, like this is on the container context, because you can set different requests per each container that you use. So if you have, if you run two containers in your pod, one Java mega application and one lightweight Rust proxy, you probably want to have different, <laughs> different resources. Just a guess. <laughs> One thing also to know for those again who've been playing more with Docker, I mean playing Docker, the CPU request is is pretty much the same as, as you define the CPU shares with Docker. That's roughly the same functionality. It's not really exactly the same, but roughly the same functionality. Yeah, and this on Linux, this then like ties back to C groups and like low level stuff happening then under the hood. Completely fair schedule, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. For the CPU, the 10M means 10 millicores. So the unit of scheduling in Kubernetes for CPU is core. The CPU core. So basically, using 10M means that you get 0.01 cores guaranteed for your application. So if you would, what yeah. whatever core means. Yes. I mean, we're running on virtualized environment. Yes. So <laughs> Nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> but if I would have one, not dedicated core, but one. Uh, how to put it? The time for the time slot that, yeah that roughly translates to time from a single CPU yes or something along those lines yeah so it's like the guys at, at Nokia and, and Intel have a couple of different projects which actually schedules one core to your application but that is not this. This won't give you a dedicated core. It just gives you approximately the time of that one core would use or have time to execute uh, some cycles on. Now we're talking about the node itself. The node yeah. Yes, the yes. And it, that's also like if you happen to land on a <laughs> more powerful node, then good for you. And if you, like if you, happen, if you landed on the, the last generations, uh, Something. Yeah, that's, I don't even, like, is it just like GPU as a number? Yes. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, like, you just say GPU 2 and hope for the best. <laughs> then, in a real case, you would probably use different things with labels and, like, uh, in, as shown before, that you actually, you're sure that you're going right, to yeah. get the right thing, but. That, that's again yeah. a pretty good example actually on the sort of extensibility of Kubernetes. So you can you can request basically anything, and it's up to the nodes and the kubelets on the nodes to specify that okay, we have these XYZs available and we have like three XYZs available for scheduling. Mm -hmm. It okay. might be GPU, it might be something else, it might be foo or bar or whatever. There's yeah. actually a Super good talk by uh, what's Henning's title now at Zalando. He's uh, head of something. Yeah, I don't so remember. Henning Jacobs from Zalando diving into these requests and limits and how they play well together. And it's uh, it's available on YouTube. Just search it and you'll find it. Cool. So the next thing we're gonna look at is a config map. <laughs> and uh, this is due to if you have your application um, where did I have it? Yeah, here, bro. So if you have your application and oh, I sorry, I think I forgot to, uh, I had it in the slides here. Yes, there. Forgot to mention this. This way here with env you set environment variables. And um, 
now this might make sense to you, like this production equals true or something, but it is <laughs> it is really really sketchy. So what you would do in real life is uh, to mount in the um, no, it wasn't here. Maybe it's somewhere else. Yeah. So you would use uh, these secret uh, secret and config map uh, resources instead, which are stored inside of the cluster, like this. It is a normal Kubernetes object, but it doesn't have spec and status. It only has data. Same goes for the secret. And here you can store any arbitrary data, including files like this, or just key value pairs. And um, this is then useful for um, times where you, I mean, you don't want to create five different image, Docker images of your app if you only have five different environments. Instead, you, you pass this environment as a variable, but you don't want to make five different but nearly similar Kubernetes manifest either. So what you're ending up doing is, is a config map where you feed to the cluster, this is the environment the cluster is in, or even the namespace, can be namespace-based, um, the environment. And then in that, you put the data and then mount it in to the pod like this. So instead of writing name and value here, you use value from and config map key reference. And here, what config map to use and what key to take the value from. So like that. Another thing we said in the beginning that uh, pods or these containers in the pods can share um, files. They can share the same um, kind of directories. And this is one way to, to demonstrate that. I have declared a volume on the pod context. So volumes are declared for pods as a whole. And uh, I say that I want to get my data from a config map. And uh, this could also be a secret. Um, if you actually had some persistent data here, you would have some GC volume or AWS EBS thing or like storage OS or Rook or whatever, uh, which would give you a block device, a disk, which you can mount. But mm, that's a, that's a, we had CRI, we had CNI, and we obviously have CSI, which is container storage interface. So that's the, way, <laughs> that's the thing you mount in there. Um, and uh, so, so you define volumes on a pod level, and then you mount it in to as many containers as you want on the container level with volume mounts. So we say that this whatever this is just whatever you put as long as they match. And then you say that this config map, pod info, should be projected on disk at the path slash config map in this, this example. Um, you don't have to do these. It's more for, for the demo. Uh, we're going to focus more on, on the rolling upgrades and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but but this this can be useful, and if you have time, just copy paste it in. Uh, one question. Yes. Maybe a bit advanced. Is there any official cube how to because config map and the pods or deployment they are separate entities they have different life cycle. If you update <coughs> the config map, is there a way native to Kubernetes to get your pods wow. restarted? So there has been. So much discussion about that. Uh, there is like way yeah. some other like like projects <laughs> kind of stuff, but still know nothing about Kubernetes itself. No, I don't think so. There, the design discussions are like pages and pages and pages upon this. Okay. So, <clears throat> when you mount mount the config maps or secret as volumes, you get the file content contents on a disk. So whenever you change the config map on the API, that change is reflected like within a couple of seconds, it's reflected on the pod mount volume. But it's up to your application to figure out that, OK, something changed and reconfigure itself. 
if it use uh, if you use like in this example if you use some config uh, value as an environment key nothing will restore it automatically or anything yeah yeah, yeah. there's the thing like somehow that again figure out that some change happens and then yeah i would use i notify but yeah. that is that is basically it's not a native way but yeah, yeah, but yeah. as as native Native as it gets. As get yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and yeah, as you said, like the the drawback of using environment variables is if you update, well, hope for the best, like, and and ho restart your <laughs> delete your pod. Um, yeah, you can't even and go and do kubectl restart pod. No, no. <laughs> you you have to do delete manually. Um, and also with regards to secrets. It's debatable, but I, I guess that it's more secret if you mount as uh, if you project it as a file rather than environment variable. But it really depends on your context. Uh, it can end up in wrong places in both ways. <laughs> I think, like I know that many people just have like if you will have your kind of uh, CI/CD pipeline and then part of it that like update of the config map and deploy it to the Kubernetes, then that's, you know that it has been changed, so you will trigger also like mm. reapplying of your, uh, or re 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 restarting, let's say, or reapplying your cube, the deployment as well, that it yes. kind of resets the containers or start them again. Yes, like the yes. yes. Map, but that's more like a software or like <laughs> higher level thing which will control the pipelines and not like specific to Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah. Some, I mean, Kubernetes is a set of building blocks. So, so this is one of the things that it doesn't provide. It doesn't provide a signal or something like that when when things change. In this specific case, um, secret is exactly the same. The only thing is that it when uh, when like stored in the API. Uh, sorry, when you, for example, kubectl get a secret, it's gonna. This is gonna be base sixty four encoded. Mind you, not encrypted. <laughs> this, this has to be clarified. Uh, it can be encrypted in a TD, in the database, though. Uh, and again, this is on best effort. If you have time to do this secret, uh, do it. Uh, if you don't, it's fine. But yeah, so, so the, the secret is, can be encrypted in, in the database using uh, encryption at rest in the API server, um, but that then depends if it's more secure or not. Kind of depends on how well you treat your your encryption keys at which are at the API server level. And yeah, it can maybe be arguably more secure if you use some cloud pri providers KMS solutions. Um, that that I can think. Um, and another thing is like the secrets won't ever be stored on disk. Uh, they're using a tempfs uh, mount. But exactly the same thing here. The only thing that changes secret key ref instead of config map key ref. Then we have uh, readiness probes and liveness probes, uh, which I, which will wait a couple of minutes because we're gonna test our stuff first. Uh, <laughs> if, if you have access to the slides, uh, go ahead and copy paste this, um, but change the URL. Uh, be careful to change the URL to exactly the thing, podinfo dot exactly the thing that you have, uh, your URL. And then it should be exposed in a couple of minutes uh, when we apply it. So go to the slides, uh, copy paste this ingress, which will provide a public URL for our pod info uh, deployment. And then we will apply all of, all of it, and hopefully it works for most people. You need to change the GKE stuff as well. Yes, exactly. So yeah. that, well, I could, for clarification, but. Uh, no, this is, I used Luxus Labs earlier. Yeah, yeah. This is. I managed like five, five different environments at the same time now. <laughs> it's still provisioning it in DigitalOcean. <laughs> Thank you.
just to make them suffer more. <laughs> more clusters. <laughs> <laughs> like throwing gas into their place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when you're done with this, uh, apply all the, so kubectl apply dash f all of the files that you have. You can also do kubectl apply uh, f and D just dot, which means current directory. So, this is a contradiction. Namespace created, namespace not found. That's interesting. Uh, try again. <laughs> Reboot and maybe it worked. <laughs> okay. Probably a race condition. Yeah. Uh, race condition in the client when it's. I, I would consider that kind of a bug, but <laughs> probably small enough so nobody noti ever noticed it. Um, you can check if if, the, if it was successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can you can use that. Uh, did you already get it working? Mm, with not really. Uh, you can use um, it's in the slides. Mm, if you go to meetup, like the meetup page. Is that the right yeah. one? Yes, uh, but I, uh, yes, uh, and then there, I, I posted as a comment there. Um, uh, there, slides available, yeah. And um, pretty far down below, um, more. And, um, yeah, even I have a command which you can use for that. There, maybe? Uh, or there? Yes, that. So, this is, um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, you, you, because you have, um, this is a service account token for this pod, and I've given this pod a uh, cluster admin. <laughs> That's why you can, can access Cube, kubectl uh, now. So, so the, <laughs> this is going to read the service account token, and you can just copy paste it into uh, into the dashboard and, and get the same privileges. <laughs> so yes, don't do this at home. <laughs> yes, don't do this at home. From secrets, right? Ah yes, <laughs> that would be uh, that More could ideal. also yeah yes. <laughs> But now that we actually have, or like, happen to use this, we'll. <laughs> the default um, default token didn't have much rights to display anything in the. Dashboard. Oh yeah, no. Uh, That's what we tried. Yes. Maybe namespace controller would have more rights. No, I think I think actually pretty much. Um, oh yeah, namespace controller. Yeah, just just try. Uh, yes, uh, this is this is <laughs> this is funny. It's a race condition in the client, so like if you run it again, it works. Because it just probably like it it did apply it, but it it already checked if the namespace. You see, like. I mean. It, it checked if the. It I guess I cannot have namespace in the namespace. I didn't put it at the list. Um, it, it's it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It just like this is just a bug in the client. I mean, there shouldn't be namespace in the namespace. Uh, no, but I think it. I think it like ignores it. So I, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, I think that this was with the. With the yeah. <laughs> kubectl magic. Black magic. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, anyone that have done this, uh, please say your number. Let's check. 25. Okay, we will we'll wait one, two minutes more. Now, Trafik is, is uh, doing the let's encrypt flow. <laughs> so, it, it's getting, so what happened here when you uh, created the ingress is that Trafik notices that, oh, it's an ingress I manage. It added its public IP, because Trafik has a public IP. It added to the status of the ingress. Then external DNS saw that, oh, I have a domain and an IP linked together. I will create this zone, or I will create this A record in this zone that I manage. That gave us this, uh, this new A record in the uh, Kubernetes Finland zone. And now when Trafik notices this, it's, it's like getting the, the cert, or like refreshing doing let's encrypt. And the public IP for this one is from the like, uh, Google instance? Like yes, yes. Go Google provides the public IP for, for this uh, using one of their load balancers. But yes? I think we have, we have some error here. Uh, um, your pr you, you need to, to change directory into workshop and then now now if you do you see that the path changes there and now you're in the right now you can do it Did you get it working? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's I just. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, wait for the. Yeah. Can you see if Trafik is, is doing anything? Yeah. So uh, where? Uh, kubectl logs. Uh, and then in the uh, namespace workshop CTL. Yeah, and then be able to, to see if it's <laughs> It probably hasn't had time. Did you just create it? Yes. Yeah, yeah then it hasn't had time yet to create the A record. It takes a couple of, I don't know, whatever the latency of external DNS is. And, or net, not external no. DNS, the, the DNS propagation. DNS yeah, propagation. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you, uh, so the, the very last thing which we'll, we'll do today, uh, we're running out of time here, but change the, now you are, are running uh, pod info 3.1.2, but change to 3.1.3, so upgrade it one patch version. 3.1.2 to 3.1.3 and apply the deployment again. Uh, we will now see when, uh, if you do it, it should be visible here. Uh, you see the, the pod info endpoint here uh, is a JavaScript, a uh, small JavaScript uh, in the page that constantly talks to the backend and tells what kind of endpoint it hit. It hits pretty much different endpoint all times. Um, due to the service, load, service and pod load balancing. And now that we 
um, upgrade it in between, we will see that it's going to hit sometime one green and one blue uh, during the, the rolling upgrade. So we're like simulating some small, small amount of traffic while, um, while it's uh, being upgraded. Yeah, there we see it. It went really fast, obviously, because now it's, well, now it's one, uh, three, one, three. Um, and it was a matter of a kubectl apply away. So as we go, we will start seeing more and more of these, um, these different things and plug in, plugging them all all together in various ways can be, can, well, makes Kubernetes really powerful. Um, and then copy that line. Try to next uh, browser that. So what's in the drive? I mean, I'm in there is the logs from the pod. Oh. Sometimes, sometimes it just uh, hangs. Mm. So you can you can do uh, delete the pod, which or yeah well it's at the end of the session. If you delete the pod, it you will get disconnected for a short while, but it's then gonna come up again and you can reconnect. But then probably it, it's gonna notice that it misses it's, it's missing a cert. It's basically so that's one of the the parts where I'm not that satisfied with traffic. Um, this is also the. One some one seven version. They have a new two, but I didn't get that working at all. <laughs> but it's it's one of the places where it it doesn't really take DNS propagation into account. So it it tries many times very fast before the DNS has propagated. Then it gives up, and then DNS propagates, and then it's like oh yeah it, yeah. It, so so that's that's a thing which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So. Mm -hmm. Especially when doing live demos. <laughs> I can think that maybe maybe using like I don't know what why what DNS server they have in this Wi-Fi, but that it could be like caching one. Well, or, or if it's faster, yeah. Things is the lab center part. What? Yeah, lab yeah. yeah. They, they, they have been now lately doing quite a lot of work. All right, yeah. And now we are hitting from the same domain quite a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably it's like half of the requests are going to be nope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Mulla on täällä tuo ingress kyllä lähtee käyntiin, koska näkee, että se vastaa, mm, tulee service oh. available, eli siinä ei ole yhteyttä tuohon palveluun. Joo. Ja, mä näen, että mulla Mitä pyörii täällä tuohon palvelu. <laughs> Joo, ja, ja jos ja port on kahdeksan. Like. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> oh. Joo. <laughs> no sit. Sort of take the skeletons that we need to do. Like you try to do the same stuff. Same things. And it's. It, so, so it what? Uh, yeah. I just killed it, it got yeah. started, but still. Died. Yeah, and if you do the logs now again, does it say anything like useful? Yeah, it's like most, like in in the majority of the cases, traffic has worked for me, but it's always been these, yeah, serving default cert. Yeah, one of the things which you also said is like, um, when we're hitting, we're hitting pretty much maybe from the same, like the same gateway, mm. we're hitting like, yeah, <laughs> x amount of <laughs> let's encrypt it. <laughs> so um, that that could be one of the the, the issues. <laughs> but it's it's kind of the the when I set up like 
it is funny because I mean all of these when I set them up, uh, kind of one by not one by one, but but in a program programmed manner. So I have the workshop CTL doing it. Uh, then it now it actually worked for all all of them. We didn't have to skip TLS for any of these. But now when doing it like this, it also when 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 I'm experimenting. Experimenting myself, it's so. Yeah. So the the let encrypt is configured to the traffic. Is the yes. traffic controlling the search management and like? Uh, yeah. So so like a better way maybe to do it now. Now traffic is is just like if it gets a request. If it gets a request on a endpoint it doesn't have a search for, mm -hmm. it returns this default search and starts doing the loop of, of the, the let's encrypt chain or like whatever. Uh, and then once it's got it back, but now it seems stuck and doesn't yeah. get any response from let's encrypt. So, but once it's got it, it's, it switches the default cert to the real one. Okay. Um, so that takes a minute or something like that, but um, in, the, in the normal case. But Maybe yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like try oh, well that's basically what my application does it it waits a certain amount of time it it like checks if traffic is healthy blah 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 and and then then uh occasionally kills it to, to make sure that like it reloads and eventually it's eventually consistent and like eventually <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we had um you probably have to just uh, skip, because we, we've had a fair amount of, I think when everybody's hitting Let's Encrypt at the same time, it's there. Okay. Uh, but he made it work, <coughs> we are using the same cluster. Yeah, yes. So, but just ignore the, the TLS warning that is uh, down, advanced. And Oh, it's no. HTS. <laughs> yeah. So it's not okay. Well, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. It should work. Yes. 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 But now it's your browser that is, like, your browser ha using H HSTS. So you need to go in the settings and remove. It's like a security feature that if you if you visited a site on HTTPS, it doesn't go back to HTTP. Or like it, if, if you visit the site securely, it doesn't go back to insecure okay. unless you remove it. I don't know where in the settings, but somewhere. Uh, <laughs> search for Chrome HSTS. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit fun. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, but now it's probably just because Let's Encrypt is flooded. <laughs> it would be nice to find because I will face this problem later. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, Google, <laughs> Google for it. From HSTS. So I, I was supposed to change the version yes, here, yes, yeah? yes. OK, but it says unchanged, even though, like. Uh, no, but that's, uh, wait, this is the deployment. But I'm, what, what thing? So how? Currently, it's on 3.1.2. Yes, yes. And now, but now you have in the same file, you have both a deployment, right? Yeah. And an ingress. Yeah. You need to have uh, the three dashes in between. Oh. For because now it's just seeing the thing, the la last thing. Oh, okay. Because it's the deployment. Yeah, now uh -huh. configured. Yes. Makes sense. Okay, what was the? H uh, S T S, I think. A uh, S. H S T S. Yes. Uh, uh, no. S. Sorry. In the yes, yes. That. Okay. Yes. <laughs> do I need to do anything with stopping? No, no, it's, it's I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll kill it after this. <laughs> so that's also another benefit of like, people can just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like just go whenever they, they want and they don't have to do mini cube clean and like all those kinds of, to, to have their laptop usable tomorrow too. Um, yeah, and, and, and if I didn't say it already, the workshop is officially over, but, well. <laughs> officially we continue. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what Epic Code says, but I will at least spend 20, 30 minutes cleaning up this thing. <laughs> so, I guess, until that. Cool.